right away. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, for our quarterly Ottertail County Workforce Convening. Um, for anyone who is new to this group, this is our, our quarterly group that we get together with virtually. Um, and just in preparing for this meeting, we've been doing this for, I think, coming up on two years, which is really pretty cool. Um, so thank you for those who have been here since the beginning. Thank you for those who have been here uh, just since our Workforce Summit last fall. We always seem to have a really good group. So um, to kick things off this morning, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, and we will get going. So the lay of the land for this morning, um, we will start off with uh, just kind of a run through of our OTC works workforce strategy as we always do. Um, and then we've got three great speakers joining us this morning. Um, Heather Newville, who is a, a contracted child care project manager with the county, um, will kind of be giving some ideas for employers to uh, do child care provider appreciation that is coming up in in May here. Um, and kind of that employer driven side of appreciation. She will share some tips and best practices for that. Um, and then Amy Johnson is joining us again this quarter. She's our youth workforce navigation um, program manager. And just with the success of some of our uh, student tours that we've been doing over the last quarter, she will kind of share some some learnings and best practices for employers who are are hoping to uh, host those tours and, and keep engaging with our youth. Um, and then we'll finish off with Amy Baldwin uh, with the county, just kind of giving a, an update on community and economic development efforts that the county did last year in 2022 and kind of our, our priorities moving forward. And then we'll finish off with a, with a Q&A and discussion time at the end. Um, so with that, just a quick overview, as we always do with our OTC work strategy. So. Um, as many of you probably are familiar with by now, OTC stands for Otter Tail County, but also stands for Opportunities, Training and Connection. Um, and that's really how we bucket our work around workforce um, in, in those three action areas. So promoting the availability of jobs um, and workforce resources within the county, um, helping employers, doing some training for employers to promote their opportunities to recruit and retain workers um, in the most effective way and then really kind of the big one that we we put a lot of our time and effort into is creating those partnerships um, for occupational readiness for reducing um, barriers to employment and then also looking at aligning skills for future workforce needs and that's where kind of the youth work comes in so um with that Oops, i will sorry. introduce our um, first speaker um which is Heather Newville. And like I mentioned before, Heather is a is a project manager, a contracted project manager with Otter Till County, um, focused on child care. And, and Heather will kind of give a little bit of her background as well, I'm sure, but she is a longtime family care provider, so has a lot of experience in this in this area. Um, and so she's gonna kind of share some some provider appreciation ideas for employers to take advantage of because like I mentioned, uh, Child Care Provider Appreciation Day is coming up on May 12th. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Heather. Thank you, Sarah. Go back. There One more? Go. Yeah. So um, as she mentioned, I am a longtime child care provider. I ran a child care program for over 20 years, most of those years in Ottertail County, but not all of them. I've lived in a couple of communities. I closed my program about 18 months ago, and now I work in Otter, with Ottertail County and across the state to provide support for child care providers, both family child care and centers in different capacities. One of the things that I hear over and over, both when I was a provider and um, working in these support roles is that providers wish that people understood the basics. They wish that they understood what family child care, what child care in general entails, the professionalism behind it and all of the requirements. So we're gonna look at the basics first. Providers work an average of 65 hours a week. This is a conservative number that is used pretty widely. Many providers are putting in 70 to 75 hours week in and week out. Licensure requires background checks, home inspections, and training. 
um, both to get licensed and then once licensing, um, initial licensing is done, these still need to be kept up. Those 16 hours of training that providers do annually need to happen in specific content areas. They often happen on evenings and weekends. So we've got providers giving up extra time outside of the hours that they generally work in order to drive to trainings. They're not usually available in all small communities and put in that time. Providers often don't feel like people understand the professionalism that they put into it, the work and the dedication that they um, commit to doing this job. First Children's Finance um, often uses the number of roughly $11 an hour is what a provider makes before taking into consideration any retirement um, contributions that they're going to make, which makes recognition and appreciation and seeing them as a valued part of the community even more important to them. And that leads us to the other thing that providers tell us they want us to know, and that has to do with well child care. Family child care and center child care, you can advance it, Sarah, yeah, um, is for well children, not sick children. That's probably one of the biggest sticking points that employers see is they hear that employees have to go pick up their children. Child care is closed because there's illness. Child care um, won't take a child for a particular reason. And that's difficult. It can seem like child care providers close at the drop of a hat. They put a lot of thought into this. Providers balance the needs of an entire group as well as the needs of individual families and children. There are supervision requirements that play into this as well as risk assessment when it comes to other children. Because confidentiality plays a piece of this, a provider can't say that a child who is ill can't come because there are medically fragile children in the program or possibly a young infant who doesn't have a well-developed immune system. So what maybe just looked like a bad cold to one family may actually be RSV that can endanger an infant, or there may be children in the program who have asthma and it could cause problems. Those are things that providers weigh out all the time. So how can we help providers? Um, when I ask them, what would be a way that employers and the workforce can show you um, some appreciation and recognition? Many of them say, you know, it's indirect, but I really wish that they would understand that we don't like excluding children. I wish that they would be easier on their employees so that the employees aren't so angry with us and that it can ease some of that stress all the way around. So what I challenge you to do is look at ways that you can potentially encourage your employees to have that backup plan. Reminding them to talk to their family, talk to their support system. Are there ways they have plans to divvy up those days off should a child be sick? How can their roles possibly be flexible when it's necessary for them to be home with a sick child? And just that underlying um, acceptance that this isn't a surprise event. Inevitably, young children get sick. Inevitably, childcare providers get sick. And sometimes this is unforeseeable, but Providers don't take it lightly. They know the, the havoc it causes when they send a child home and an employee has to rush to pick up a child and they don't relish that. It's not something they make as a decision lightly. So once we look at the basics and just understanding that piece of childcare more, what are some things we can do that are tangible and show appreciation and recognition for childcare? As Sarah mentioned, Child Care Provider Appreciation Day is May 12th. It's always the Friday before Mother's Day. And while appreciation and recognition is definitely welcome during that time, often providers feel unseen the rest of the year. I would encourage you to look at possibilities for creating an appreciation plan, whether that's twice a year, whether that's quarterly, finding ways that you can show that appreciation or extend recognition to childcare providers throughout the year will create lasting change in how they feel about their jobs, how they feel valued within the communities and um, retention with childcare providers. So what can that look like? Looking at what you can do for providers, there are three different areas. There are the providers that actually provide services for your employees. Is that your target? 
there could be child care providers who are customers of your business, loyal customers, clients that you have. Are there ways to show them appreciation? Do you want to find a way to show appreciation for the community's providers as a whole? Those are all different scopes, and that's a choice you can make best based on what your business is and what your commitment can be to this. And then looking at how often, biannually, quarterly, um, just at Child Care Provider Appreciation Day, which again is always um, welcomed as well. Looking at that, the next thing I would recommend is collecting stories that are positive from your employees, asking them to talk about their providers, submit something that gives the name and contact information and what they enjoy about child care. That way you're getting more than just the negative stories. You're getting to hear some of the positive impact that child care providers um, provide for the families and the community. That information also is a great thing to put in a thank you card. Recognition can be as simple as a card with a personal note. I can tell you, I still have cards from 10 and 20 years ago in an envelope that were kind words from businesses that where I do business, from parents. We pull those out on hard days and look at them and they get us through because they remind us that we do um, a valuable job. And um, when we're not getting a lot of feedback, it helps. So something as simple as a card saying, our employees tell us they don't have to worry about their children when they're in your care. And we really appreciate that they can put their attention to their jobs. Thank you for the work you do, can be enough. If you wanna go a step further than that, obviously you could throw a coffee gift card, um, movie tickets, restaurant gift cards. There's all kinds of different things you could put in there. You could include cash, um, lots of different options. You could go a little further than that. Most providers say that they don't have the resources and the time for self-care. We know, especially after the last few years, that self-care is very important. And when you're working the kind of hours providers have, a little self-care goes a long way. So considering gifts that allow providers some freed up time or um, uh, some resources for pampering makes a difference. You could offer gift cards for a massage or a pedicure. Um, you could offer food. Providing breakfast for the program frees up some time in the morning for a provider. You could bring a fruit tray and muffins, maybe a gallon of milk. You could provide lunch for the program. If not providing for the program, you could provide for the provider. One of the things I enjoy about not having children in my home anymore is I can go to lunch. Providers don't get to go to lunch. Reaching out and saying, we appreciate what you do. We'd love to bring you lunch on Thursday. What would you like and what time should we drop it off? Can make a big difference. Maybe they can eat something that they don't make normally in peace when the children lay down for a nap and enjoy a meal. Um, all different ideas. If you have a service or product that you supply through your business, you could consider giving discounts on that. That could be to employees, providers, it could be to customers and clients, it could be at large. I lived in a community once where the grocery stores gave a 5% discount to licensed child care providers. It didn't seem like a lot, but every time I showed proof that I was a provider and got that discount at the grocery store, I felt valued. It goes a long way in feeling seen and respected in a community. I have received um, a card and um, a small gift card from my bank in the past, thanking me for being a customer and for the work I do in the community. It can be small things. I still have most of those cards. They make, they make more difference than you would know. If you wanna go a step further and provide something for the program, you could also make it more of a gift basket. Um, on a biannual basis, spring, summer, you could bring a playground ball, some sidewalk chalk, a card for the provider with maybe a little gift for her inside of it. And that adds some fun for the program as well. Fall, winter time, it could be Clorox wipes, Kleenex, some paper towels and crayons and a ream of paper. All things that providers use on a regular basis and add to some fun for them. Seasonal books for the program are always a good idea. These are all different, different ways that we can show appreciation that don't take a lot of um, a lot of work. Another idea is to sponsor training for a provider. That can go a long way. That adds up over the year. Um, 
a training can cost around $20, but it can go up to $60 or more per person for CPR and first aid training. And it adds up for providers over the course of time. Sometimes providers enjoy going to conferences, sponsoring their conference attendance makes a difference. So looking at different ways that we can provide appreciation, what, is, what does that do in the long run for us? And what we know is that providing appreciation builds relationships. And as you're building those relationships with providers, that turns into opportunities. It means that as a provider has some openings, they know your business name. They know that you see them as a valued part of the community and they may call and reach out and say, I've got some openings coming up. Do you have employees looking for childcare? It gives you an opportunity that when you're hiring someone who needs childcare, you've already built a relationship that you can reach out and say, we've got somebody looking for childcare for this age group. Would you have anything? They may not, but they'll be more receptive to businesses and employers who have shown that they value childcare. It all works together. Those relationships make a difference for everyone's satisfaction. That sums up most of what I have for you. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah. Great, great tangible things. Uh, we also did put together just a quick little handout for folks, which I will send up, uh, send out and follow up to this meeting that kind of goes over, like Heather talked about, you know, ideas for providers who actually provide care for your employees' children, and then just some community-wide appreciation ideas as well. Um, so any quick questions for Heather? Otherwise, feel free to drop those in the chat and we can keep moving um, on to our speaker. But thank you, Heather, for, for some of those personal examples as well. That really does um, help folks kind of brainstorm and, and understand that it doesn't take a, a whole lot. It's sometimes just the small things that really make a difference. So any questions right off the bat? Otherwise, we'll keep going with our next speaker. All right. Well, with that, I will turn it over to Amy Johnson. Amy, um, as many of you know, is our Youth Workforce Navigation Program Manager. Um, and she will kind of share, we've done, how many have we done, Amy? Five, four tours here in the last few months. And and hopefully we'll get two more on the schedule. We had to do some rescheduling here the past two weeks with two more tours. Um, but she will kind of share some, some best practices for putting together tours for students to welcome the, them into your business. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Amy Johnson. Um, we have actually planned seven tours since May of 2022. Um, there are two that unfortunately Mother Nature had one up on us. So um, they are planned and that is the hard work, um, but hopefully we will be able to reschedule those yet this school year. Um, and so this presentation is based on the success of Ottertail County's field trips that we have planned um, and what we have learned um, has been best practices for us to hold those successful trips. So what we have found is there is really five components of a successful tour, and that would be your audience, tour guides or presenters, the logistics of the tour, content of the tour, and then following up. A business tour is an activity that brings students to a workplace to learn more about a company and its industry. Observe the employees in their normal work routines and ask questions of employees. Schools or teachers can initiate company tours by reaching out to local employers and companies can also initiate them by offering tours to schools in their communities. So today's presentation will offer instruction to employers. The first component of the tour is the audience. And so really you want to identify the right students to create a more meaningful event. What grade do you want to invite? Juniors and seniors are closest to entering the workforce, but students are beginning to have these career discussions in school as soon as ninth grade, sometimes earlier. And then finding the students that have interest in the careers you want to show them. Students that are interested in trades, healthcare, agriculture, automotive, manufacturing, you can make that ask. Um, for Ottertail County, there's roughly 2,500 students in high school. You can filter those students down to the students that, that you want to bring to your facility 
For our seven tours, that is what we have been doing. And on average, we see about 40 students attend these tours and probably on average, three to five teachers or adults. Also, find schools that are within 50 miles or so of your business. They will travel to you. Um, the county's online directory, k12navigator.org, will help you find these schools. And then next, ident identify the right teacher to contact. And again, to create the most meaningful experience for both the student and your business, you would want to identify those right students. Um, you can do this by accessing the school's website staff directory um, to find emails and filter down on the industry or area that you're looking for that matches the teachers, um, what they're teaching. Call the main office and, and ask them who would teach that class for, for what students you're looking for. Um, you can always use the k12navigator.org again to get the right contact at the school. Otherwise, teachers that I work closely with, um, ag teachers don't just teach ag. They're always a good starting point. Shop teachers, autos teachers, business teachers are really excited about um, bringing students to field trips. They are the ones that are typically teaching the career class. Um, and also, lastly, uh, when you do email the schools, you find their information, however you contact, um, it's good to send them a flyer or pictures of your facility or product. We have been creating a flyer to send. The teachers print that off and pass it around um, in their classes to be able to find the students that, that want to go. Next slide. So tour guide and presenters, this would be the second component. So you've identified your audience. Now you have to figure out who's going to talk to that audience. Who, who of your employees do you want engaging with these students? And really, it's a it's it's a recruitment effort for you as well. Um, who's going to speak to your business the best and get the results that you want? So choose engaging presenter, an employee who is charismatic, who, who has worked his or her way up the ladder. Students like to hear those stories. An employee who is an emerging leader. This experience will empower that individual and build them some new skills. Um, a good tip in presenting is to not talk at the students, but talk with them. Make sure that you are engaging them, asking questions, um, ask open-ended questions. Um, another thing, as I mentioned, we had 40 students on our, on our tours. We would break those students up into smaller groups, 10 to 15 students. Um, has shown the most success where they are the most engaged and the least distracted. Um, so incorporate some of your employee career path stories into the visit. Students do actually like hearing CEO or owner stories. There are a lot of budding entrepreneurs in our schools right now. Um, mobile tour guides and stationary presenters. This is what I call them. <laughs> A mobile tour guide moves with the groups station to station. Stationary presenters stay in the same space and repeat their presentation to the different groups that are moving through. It just creates a cleaner um, flow of traffic and, and presentation. The third component is the logistics of the tour. How long how long should we schedule the tour? That's a question that I'm asked every time. Um, students' tours often last 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how large your facility, how much you have to talk about, um, how much you can offer the tour. Uh, how many students and teachers will we expect? That's another question I get. You won't know until you send that flyer out or your invite out and find out. If you do have a max, that's something you should tell them up front. Um, we can accept 20 students, that's all we can fit, or or whatever it may be. Um, most businesses so far will say we'll take all that we can get, and um, the most that we've had is 65 at Perham Health. Um, so can the tour include lunch? Students love to eat. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. If you feed them, they will eat. 
This creates an opportunity to add a presentation. So uh, we went somewhere, they served them donuts. A little shy when they first get there. So if you walk them through and then feed them, that's a little more successful. Um, but if you're feeding them lunch, that's an opportunity where they're sitting down, they can hear your CEO story, your company overview, um, anything you want to add in um, at that point. Another thing is where do you want the buses to drop off the students and where should they park? And do you wanna invite the bus driver in? Sometimes the teacher's the bus driver, sometimes they hire a bus driver. Those bus drivers are just as interested as the students. Um, so if you're open to them coming in, they love the invite. Um, and then who will greet the group upon arrival? And lastly, what are your visitor safety requirements? That should have been first. Um, do you have requirements for PPE, clothing requirements? What should they wear? What should they not wear? There's manufacturers where you can't wear jewelry. Um, there, I mean, every business is a little bit different, so it's important to have that information on your advertisement that you create for them. So the fourth component is the content of the tour. So you've identified your audience, you know who's coming, you know who your tour guides and presenters are going to be, you have a plan. Now, um, what, what is that presentation going to be? Consider all of your departments to be part of the tour, especially those areas that are highest in demand of your business. Take advantage of this opportunity with all of these individuals of the future workforce in your business. Um, and those also those departments or positions at your facility that are not often thought of or hidden, I think, you know what that means at your business because we all have them. Uh, take advantage of the opportunity to showcase all of the different careers your business offers. You can even focus a tour on one department. Break down, break down the department by function. Um, we did one on engineering in May of 2022. Um, and then we were able to focus, have the businesses help us focus on the different functions of engineering and really teach the student that it's not just industrial engineering, there's design engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the different opportunities that you can go within that one career path. Um, we also were planning an IT field trip um, that Arvig has done an awesome job planning, but Mother Nature didn't allow it to happen yet, but that will happen. And that is to teach the students all of the different opportunities that there are within IT and we would also we were also visiting Otter Tail Power. Um, and then um, provide a flyer again um, of your jobs and or career progression that your business offers. So make sure the student understands what the ladder looks like at your company, where they would start on that ladder and if they want to, how high could they go? Um, what is your presenters going to talk about? Talk about what they do in their job every day. The students want to hear what their job is. What do they do for eight hours? How did they get to where they're at? Did they get there internally through succession? Or else what was their external career path? What jobs did they have to do in order to get there? Did they have to go to college to be in the position they're in? And what is the favorite part of their job? Um, benefits. So, controversial or not, students actually ask about benefits. <laughs> so, I say yes, do not get in the weeds on this, but do offer an overview of the employee benefits. They've been asking this question during our tours and it's being discussed in some of their classrooms right now. So, it would be really great to make that connection between classroom and business. What kind of insurances do you offer? Do you have fringe benefits? What are your retirement options? I'll talk about your events that you do. Some employee, some businesses do great employee events. Um, company picnics, holiday parties, things like that. Show them pictures of those events. Show them pictures of your employees having fun. Do you have employee resource groups? Really what sets you apart from the other employers? Um, show your employees at work while you're on the tour and offer hands-on experiences as much as possible. Many students have a listening reserve, no fault to their own. 
it's how they're built. They need to see, feel, touch, and smell. Keep the tour as engaging as possible, even during those presentations. Creating engaging activities is always helpful. And I've been able to help some businesses come up with those, and that's been a really fun task. Um, applying what you do in your business to a learning lesson for students. Always save time for Q&A at the end. It's unlikely students will have questions upon arrival, but they will ask questions as they go about the tour and at the end. Lastly, they do love swag. Some things that have been given out, if you give them a ball cap, they'll wear it the rest of the day. Um, T-shirts, company artifacts, pens, any industry related items. If all else fails, give them food. The fifth component is follow up. So this is really doing that evaluation of how the tour went, anything that needs to be changed. Email the teachers that accompanied the students. Did the tour meet the teacher's expectation? What was the feedback from the students? Um, and then gather feedback from your presenters and tour guides. Did the tour meet your goals? You have your plan. Remember, you did the hard part. If you've made it this far, now all you're doing is the ask of inviting the students going forward. You can do this school year after school year after school year. Just make little tweaks. Um, next step would be when you do email that teacher, offer follow-up activities to the teacher. The students have now seen your business. What, how, what other ways will you engage with those students and make your ask. If you have students interested in continuing to ex explore careers at our company, here's what else we offer. Do you offer internships, job shadows, classroom speakers, employment? Right now, schools are wondering where summer employment is. Great opportunity to reach out to them. Reference the list of ways to engage with students on the k12navigator.org. So I'm sure many or maybe all of you have registered on the k12navigator.org by now. If you haven't, this is an opportunity to help you identify what areas you will engage with students, and then you will have that list ready. Um, and then again, marketing, email your company brochure or any handouts that you sent home with the students so that the teacher has them. If down the road, the student says, remember when we went to that business and they gave us that, do you have it? Then the teacher will have it. So really, that is it. You've just set yourself up for a successful tour. Here's pictures from our tours that we have done. Once you establish a document, and once you establish and you document your plan. So all of these steps that I just brought you through, document what you do. When you have a documented plan and a process, it gets easier every time you conduct this tour. That's all, Sarah. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, and as you can see here on the screen, we've got quite a few large groups that we've taken out and it's been really, really fun. Even as a, um, you know, not so long ago was I a student and I remember going and seeing businesses and just seeing those kids, not not kids, students come out of the, the school day and just kind of get out of their element and it really opens their eyes. So it's a an awesome experience. Um, with that being said, I'm not sure that we we might have a couple folks online um, that have actually gone through this process either with Amy or on their own um, to host tours or to host students. Um, so I just wanted to pose the question, would anyone be willing to unmute or drop in the chat kind of what their planning process looked like? Um, was it was it overwhelming? Was it complicated? Was it easy? Um, and how that kind of went and maybe even some learnings from doing that as well. Feel free to drop that in the chat or unmute yourself too. We're happy to have some discussion here. My name is Amber Mesker. I'm from Genio. Yeah, hi Amber. I did go through the process with Amy and I thought it was very easy. She was very helpful in guiding me on um, what, what needed to be done, who needed to be contacted. Um, we did a tour of our hatchery here in Henning um, we had a good group of students. Um, I believe there was good feedback. 
the I thought that the process was easy. We had two individuals um, participate with the tour that were um, people that have worked their way up to supervisor and management um, positions. So they had, you know, a story to tell about their experience with the company, their process of getting to where they were now. Um, I I enjoyed it, and honestly, I look forward to working with Amy again on literally any project. Um, she's very helpful, and and I really felt like it was um, beneficial to me, to our management team, um, and to the students in our local communities here. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Amber. I saw Katherine Anderson, you dropped in the chat a quick comment. Do you want to unmute and just kind of give the, the student side of things? Because you get to see when they go back into school and they talk about it and, and gossip about it. Do you want to share anything that you've kind of gathered from, from those tours too? Yeah, I think that it's just so good to get students into the businesses and you know you can hear about it or you can look online but until you actually walk through there you don't have an idea of what it's really like um so yeah feel free to contact teachers i like amy's suggestion of um you know just looking on the directory at a school and see who those teachers are who might be the ones um, that you could reach out to and realizing that teachers are so busy that sometimes they don't take time to actually make those contacts. So if you can make that first contact, that's very helpful. If a school happens to have a work-based learning coordinator like Fergus Falls does, that's a great starting place as well. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. I always like to say if they can see it, they can be it. Like students don't know what they can be until they've seen those opportunities, especially if it's something outside of you know, if they don't have parents who are in an industry that they're interested in, or if they don't have family members, they just don't know what the possibilities are. So really being able to see that firsthand, even, you know, even in 90 minutes gives them a perspective that they didn't have before that. So, all right. Any other comments, additions? Uh, hi, this is, is that okay. Carly? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. You can go ahead. This is Patty Fandrick at um, Pioneer Care, and, and Amy was kind enough to bring a, a large group of girls, of students, through our facility earlier this year, and, and I have to thank her for that. It was a great experience. Sometimes um, we have a tendency to worry about who's going to do the presentations, and you know, not all of our staff are comfortable doing presentations. But when you break them up into groups of 10 and you just ask a staff member to talk about what they do, they are great presenters. People love to talk about what their job is and to tell other people. And the excitement that comes through both, um, the, not only the student, but the employee as well, it, it's more than anybody can do in, in advertising or or me and HR. I can't I can't really relay that feeling and, and go into depth like what the employee can do. So I'd encourage to make sure that you have people that are doing the job, doing the presenting and just keep them small so they're not intimidating. Patty, I want to add to that. When we were at Pioneer, one of my students walked out of the memory care unit and said, oh my, this is where I want to work after just walking through there. And like they said earlier, seeing it outside is one thing, seeing it inside and hearing, hearing the stories and hearing the people that work there. And that means a lot to, to students when they're making their decision. Yeah, Catherine, I can't remember if it was one of your students, but Amy, Amy has shared the story with us that um, they walked out of a memory care saying, well, that felt like home. I didn't know working in memory care could feel like home. And that was somewhere that I could see myself working. So that was really fun to hear. That's why we do it. All right, Amy, anything additional? Otherwise, we'll keep moving. No, that's it. Um, I can drop my. I can. Oh, Ileana just put something in chat. Um, I, I do feel bad for Arvig because that is the business that took two, um, 
two tours from uh, Mother Nature, um, one for IT and one for trades that we're working on. So Ileana said, we're looking forward to rescheduling the field trips. Our team was very excited to receive the students. Hopefully the weather cooperates. I'm not a meteorologist, but I think we're done. So it's gonna work next time. But I thank everybody for being so engaging in this process and with open arms, um, those that have participated, which is so many, we've seen the success ourselves and Catherine's story that, that she told, and I, that's my favorite story is that student. It just warms your heart um, to hear those things. And that's why we do this work to help them find their spark and uh, define their career path. It makes their life easier and it helps um, the economic development of, of Otter Tail County and really in so many factors. So thank you everybody for your participation and I'll drop my email in the chat in case we hadn't talked yet. Hi, Amy yeah. and team. Sorry, it's Carly. Sorry, I was having technical problems. If you wanted me to chime in at all, please share. Yes, Carly has done a couple field trips so far at Brunswick. Um, she helped us with our pilot program. Um, for engineering, and then recently has done, uh, was part of the manufacturing field trip. So Carly, can you tell, just give a business uh, a testimony of how that experience was? You bet, absolutely. Um, yeah, so like Amy said, we we welcome all the time, anytime we can students, but we're closely with the team to do different groups. And I think as um, employers, as often as you can have that partnership and exposure to our workforce is just great to help our future um, and really breaking breaking the mold and the stigma and exposing them to as many different opportunities and then also getting their feedback. So that was something that was really great for us too is um, surprises maybe that they can share, um, but also you know some feedback, the things that they learn too. And then it helps just build those relationships for future things that you could do um, out in the community or schools as well. So we're grateful for the opportunity. We, we appreciate the continued partnership that you provide. Um, as far as what it takes to coordinate, so very simple and the team really helps with that and makes it easy. Um, so it's a fluid process and something that I would highly encourage everyone to do. Thanks, Carly. Yeah. And thank you to all of those businesses. There's many of you on on the call today that have opened up your doors to students, whether that be part of our program or just on your own. Um, wanted, to, wanted to say thank you as well. Um, and Amy had a great segue, you know, students and, and exposing students to these businesses is really great for economic development for the entire county. So with that, I'm going to um, pass it on to, to Amy Baldwin um, to kind of talk about some of those broader community and economic development efforts of the county. Great. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And and I'll just uh, chime in. I've always said one of the best parts of my job as I've worked in community and economic development for some time now has been to get inside the doors and, and see what happens inside the walls of all the great uh, employers and businesses that we have in our area. So um, as an adult, I love it. And so I, I just love that last slide showing all those students getting inside the businesses that we have here in Otter Tail County. So thank you to the businesses for your partnership on that. Um, so as Sarah said, you know, this uh, our broader community ec economic development work um, is a lot focused around workforce. So we've been, you know, we just heard a very specific workforce uh, effort with our youth workforce navigation programming. Um, and, you know, earlier I heard about child care, but as we look in that broader realm of you know, how are we supporting the big workforce need? And it 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 isn't simple and it isn't a single solution. But as we look at community and economic development uh, across, we have four broad strategies that we are supporting at the county with partners and um, you know different agencies that we engage with within the broader county context. But you know, many of you are familiar with the work we've been doing for a number of years, led by uh, Eric Osberg to put Otter Tail County on the map and make sure it's front and center. We know we need more folks here to fill those jobs, um, you know, than what we have available in, in county right now. So a lot of work happening there. Uh, infrastructure is where um, I spend a bulk of, of my time and our team's time it, around the housing, broadband, child care. We heard about really expanding what we're doing in child care over the last year as well. 
and then employer resources, kind of where we are today um, in this session as one of those um, components of how we're supporting our employers and then welcoming communities, uh, making sure that when we have folks here, whether they're, they're students, you know, hopefully coming back or staying here, that they feel supported and welcomed or new residents that might be coming in that uh, making sure again that, that the, the support is there to build those community connections and uh, keep folks uh, once they uh, either choose to stay or are coming into the county. So as we look at, um, you know, housing has been a, a strong effort for a number of years. We rolled out the Big Build initiative uh, at the end of 2019. Um, so we've been tracking since that point progress towards the goal of 5,000 new housing units or rehabbed units by 2025. Uh, last year, we saw just shy of 500 throughout the county um, with four, 444 new housing units built last year, and that was an increase of 13% uh, from 2021. So we we're good, glad to see that. We'll see what the market conditions, rising interest rates, et cetera, um, how that impacts things in 2023. Uh, as we look into this year, but we are continuing to be um, aggressive and wanting to support projects, eliminate those barriers that might be preventing a housing project from moving forward um, and, uh, and bringing new programs out as we did launch last year, some new financial supports for uh, different housing investment components. Uh, as we look at specifically how we were engaged in housing, I'm gonna flip to the next slide, Sarah. The, we got more involved, more directly involved last year in housing projects. And so, um, and there's a lot of ways for employers to be involved in these as well. Um, and so as we, you know, look across the county, how do we help support um, projects? We, you know, these, it's not a simple task uh, to get housing going these days with construction costs, as I mentioned, interest rates uh, rising as well. Um, but there is still just such a strong need and demand for housing. Um, we use our data that shows you know what is our projected um, demand for different types of housing and two areas that we particularly look at are affordable senior housing and having that housing product for uh, folks who might be uh, ready to transition out of that single family home which then could open up that home for a new home buyer a new family coming into the area and uh, provide that more affordable uh, ownership opportunity because we know construction costs are high so we are looking at some affordable senior rental models and how we can support that to get um, get that product out there again high demand for that and then also looking at uh, single family um, entry level housing. So how can we support that new construction? Because, um, you know, while construction costs are high, if we don't start um, continuing to build that inventory, we're going to have a big gap of that product type as our housing stock continues to uh, roll through its um, life cycle. So uh, wanting to work on that as well. Um, and just, you know, we have a couple of our um, kind of housing support programs that our Housing and Redevelopment Authority supports, but wanted to highlight that um, the need for, again, that affordable housing, you know, these are a lot of our entry level workers, our maybe single wage earning households that um, provide support and they're, they are eligible for these um, uh, rent supports but there just truly is not units for them to move into. And so that's just a, an ongoing challenge as we think about it. And then our, um, again, yeah, just a, a strong need for more housing across the spectrum. So we'll keep uh, moving towards that in 2023 and beyond. So shifting out of housing, uh, we continue to try to support the expansion of uh, fiber access for high-speed internet throughout the county. Grateful for our partnerships um, at, with our local providers of Arvig and Park Region. Uh, we were successful, they were successful, I should say, in securing state funding to do uh, two fairly large projects in areas that have been unserved or underserved from a, a broadband perspective in the county and uh, partnering townships did provide uh, matching funds to help make those grant applications competitive and ultimately awarded. So more investment coming there as we continue to um, work through a lot of federal funding coming to support this area um, of work as far as continuing to expand it. So making sure we we're we're appreciative and, and uh, lucky in Ottertail County to have uh, great partners helping to expand that and continuing to look at um, getting the whole county served by by broadband in 
hopefully the near future. Now we heard about childcare, um, you know, some of the supports we're doing and working with Heather. Uh, we have another contracted part-time individual, Tammy Anderson, who also has a wealth of background in childcare. Um, those supports, uh, those two um, contracted folks have been made available as a result of funding from West Central Initiative. So appreciative of their support and longstanding commitment to early, uh, um, early child um, supports and uh, also, we this last year developed a grant program to directly help our providers either existing to make investments in their uh, operations or to support the startup of additional or expansion for that uh, child care need that continues to be so great and impacting our workforce availability. Uh, we were awarded a state grant to uh, continue to enhance this work. Um, uh, and we have this year to spend it, 2023. So we're uh, actively taking grant applications. And um, I think to date now, uh, we've provided 19, uh, approved 19 grants across the county for again, new or expanding or uh, existing providers to invest in that. Um, our capacity has remained stable, but we know again, there's still just strong need. We hear it um, ongoing that people aren't able to either start a job or go back to work uh, because of the lack of available childcare. So we'll keep working on that. Uh, finally, uh, workforce, and we heard about the, um, uh, from Amy, some of the, the work around um, those tours that we've been doing. We launched the K-12 Navigator last year, and if you're not, as a business registered on that, um, please do. It's a great way for our schools to connect with you and to find out, you know, who's willing to open their doors. And it might not, you know, and maybe a tour isn't isn't what um, your business can offer for for uh, various reasons. But if you would be a classroom speaker, or you know, maybe host a, an intern or something that might be in that that scale or scope of your organization, there's a way to indicate um, where you're. Uh, willing and able to be involved in career exploration for our students across Ottertail County. Uh, we have a steering committee that's helping support this work. A number of you on the call today are part of that steering committee. Thank you for your work on that as well. Um, and then beyond youth, uh, we are working with M State on some in-demand skills training and uh, to you know realign the skills of maybe folks who are. Um, maybe not fully participating in the workforce and and how can we help remove barriers for that again whether it's access to child care transportation barriers or the training piece on that that um, how can we help from again the county's perspective play a role in in supporting um, getting as many people productively working in in the workforce as possible so as we look into 2023 uh, and beyond oh we also do a lot of outreach and communication this event being one of them. If you're not getting our emails, um, I'm assuming you are since you're on this call, or if you know folks who um, maybe say they're not getting information about what we're working on uh, from our area, just let us know and we'll get them added to either our email distributions or um, other ways to, to get out and willing to do presentations at any community group, city council, EDA, um, uh, really any group that we will come out and talk and share this information where where um, it may be valuable. Uh, and then looking into uh, 2023, I've mentioned, you know, kind of keeping the same priorities, um, continuing to work on housing investment, supporting, um, you know, those uh, housing programs and projects that um, might have barriers. How can we help remove those and uh, expanding child care availability and um, access uh, and then the workforce piece as well. Uh, there's a lot of work happening at the state legislature in a lot of our, our same priority areas. So we've also been active in sharing our message about what are the challenges around childcare, housing, workforce, uh, broadband, and making sure our voice is heard at the state so they can hear um, firsthand what the challenges are and how maybe a state supported um, action can help with uh, making progress in those areas. So. Um, just a quick overview there, but happy to answer any questions or certainly if there's questions on our other speakers today, um, feel free to unmute or drop in the chat and uh, we will send a follow up email with uh, information as Sarah mentioned, uh, so opportunities to engage offline as well. So I'll stop and see if there's questions. 
Thanks, Amy. Yeah, it's great to see. I mean, we, we're in it all the time, so it's great to step back and, and remember how a workforce is connected to housing and connected to childcare and all those different things. So thanks for that. All right. Any questions for Amy or Amy Johnson or Heather? Um, specific questions, broad questions, we're open to that now. Um, also, all of their contact information is is included here um, and will be included in the in the follow up email as well. We'll have some, like I mentioned, some follow up pieces with the child care appreciation ideas. Um, and Amy Johnson will have kind of a step by step um, of the five components that she talked about for student tours as well. Um, so that'll go out in the follow up in addition to a recording of our of our meeting since I did remember to click record. <laughs> If there aren't questions, we'll, we're right on time. So we will let you guys go, but thank you again for taking time out of your Thursday morning um, to spend with us. Great. Thanks everyone, take care. Thanks all.